I am ashamed to say, probably have consumed more books about education than any sane human being in the world. I've been reading them now for 13 years at the rate of at least one a day, and often many more when I have whiskey nearby. <laughs> was designed about a hundred years ago. It is not the timeless form that, uh, that teacher college textbooks say it is. It was quite consciously designed about a hundred years ago and quite consciously to prevent the development of independent thought. That sounds awfully creepy, and it probably is awfully creepy, but the people who did this thought that they were obeying not God's will, but evolution's will. The short answer test, with its fixation on disconnected bits of data, can be regarded as a training laboratory in which the ability to think in contexts is surgically removed, while at the same time, certain useful habits, like concentration on sound bites and fact bites, is installed. If you think of the divide and conquer principle, which Julius Caesar perfected to prevent the formation of alliances among the Gauls dangerous to himself, short answer tests and the habits that must be developed in reading and memorization to do well on them are a way of dividing the mind from its innate ability to think in complex holes. Only men and women practiced in complex thinking, which cannot be reduced to bits of information, can ever challenge the status quo successfully, and who would want employees like that? If you can only think in fact bits, like a quiz show contestant, if you can only think in fact bits, you aren't likely to cause any manager, whether political or industrial, to lose much sleep. Short answer tests effectively foreclose a student's need to read and think for himself or herself. He need only read what he is told and think of the answer that's going to be required. What is being tested actually is obedience and memory, not the quality of mind.
attention. The history of modern American schooling is a history of deliberately prolonged childishness imposed on young people for reasons that its architects considered wholly benign. It was intended to enhance the efficiency of the national economy and of centralized social management. School as we know it, institutional, hierarchical, divorced from experience, divorced from responsibility, teaching low-grade irrelevancies, and even those taught in a fragmented, obsessively competitive way, was constructed to serve very specific purposes, none remotely connected with what any philosopher for the past 2,500 years anywhere on this planet would have thought of as education. The rest of the population utterly addicted to consumption and instantly dissatisfied with what they purchased. Those of you who own a computer know well <laughs> what I'm talking about. It's urgently necessary that almost immediately upon your acquisition of a computer or a car that you learn that you've made a hideous mistake, <laughs> that there's a master chip out there and it's coming down the line and it's about to obsolete. You're, you're which comes out in the 60s, this famous sociologist said the same thing. He said they'd spent 10 years looking and school didn't make any difference at all. Whether it was good or bad didn't make any difference. I mean, you're at liberty to reserve judgment on that, but, uh, but I took this piece of information from a wonderful, wonderful book called The Credential Society by Randall Collins, that's Academic Press, New York, 1979. It's a historical study of education and social stratification, and Collins says basically it doesn't make any difference at all. students and most parents tolerate schooling for one reason. In spite of the idealistic rhetoric, they tolerate it because of its promise of good jobs. And this is where the crisis isn't coming, it is upon us. From the perspective of school's clientele, they are increasingly being made aware that this promise is just a lie. School is becoming an intolerable waste of time, expensive in both time and money, because the credentials which school offers are increasingly seen as illegitimate. Any of you sitting there who have a PhD degree uh, will know what I'm talking about.
gospel at the Cato Institute. That's Joseph Schumpeter, who's surely one of the handful of influential academics of the 20th century, creative destruction. So I have read in the last month in the financial press, uh, Investors Business Daily, The Wall Street Journal, The Financial Times, Forbes, at uh, all, that not to worry, creative destruction is on its way. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> That sounds like a religious notion to me, <laughs> which you take on faith. Nothing wrong with faith unless, unless you have faith that there's going to be dinner on the table next week from some miraculous source. Uh, I was raised to believe God helps those who help themselves. <laughs> Our schooling is now on a collision course with destiny. It was created to release a numbed and dumbed mass on the world. That includes executives as well as factory workers who could be used as human resources which produces magnificent efficiency in the executive ranks. You can decide to spend people here or there, this way or that way, or you can say, sorry, but creative destruction has reached your, uh, your job. Uh, uh, the famous economic thinker, Adam Smith, suggested at the beginning of his best-known book, The Wealth of Nations, that all children have the ability to be profound thinkers. That book was published in 1776, and it's the Bible of the libertarians, the Bible of the conservatives in this country, none of whom, I believe, ever bothered to read the book. <laughs> Because if they did, they would discover, among other things, that Smith says that all kids have innate genius and the bell curve is deliberately created by the opportunities offered those kids. He said the difference between a street sweeper and a philosopher is only a matter of, I'm quoting directly from Wealth of Nations, habit, custom, and education, not one of genius and disposition. All children, Smith continued, share a talent for curiosity and wonder. All are gifted in conversation. All are very much alike. The most controversial thought I hope to leave behind with you is that the cherished childhood that many of us uh, sacrifice quite a bit to protect is a curse on children. It permanently disadvantages them. Nothing on earth such as adolescence ever existed until it was invented approximately in the year 1906 by an absolute lunatic who looked like a lunatic, the founder of Clark University, the school for psychologists, somehow or other, I put his name out of my head, and if you know what it is, don't, don't remind me, because he, de <laughs> he depresses me so much. Adolescence was deliberately invented.